Hello, everybody, and welcome to A Mighty Blaze. The blaze was sparked when COVID-19 extinguished the traditional in-person book tour. Our New York Times bestselling co-founders, Jenna Bloom and Caroline Levitt, joined forces to promote new books coming out for their authors. And welcome specifically to Lit Thick. I am your host, Bo Ellis. I am the Facebook director of The Blaze, one of their many producers, an unpublished writer, and I won a raffle, so now I'm hosting. <laughs> uh, this week, we have award-winning author T. Greenwood. She has published 13 novels. She has received grants from the Sherwood Anderson Foundation, the Christopher Isherwood Foundation, the National Endowments for the Arts, the Mar and the Maryland State Arts Council. She has won three San Diego Book Awards, Five of her novels have been Indie Next Best Picks, and her new novel, her 14th novel, published just yesterday, Such a Pretty Girl, which is a look into New York City in the 70s and today, complex mother-daughter relationships, modeling, acting worlds, and so much more. So, T, it is so great to have you here. Do you prefer to go by T or Tammy? Tammy. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for yeah. having me. It's exciting to be here. No, and it is so great to have you here. What is Such a Pretty Girl kind of about as just a quick overview for people who haven't heard of it yet? Okay. Um, it is the story of Ryan Flanagan and her mother, Fiona, mm -hmm. um, and it takes place in dual timelines. So we meet Ryan as an adult um, in present day, and she's sort of um, a re recluse um, living in Vermont. And um, she gets some news um, that a um, sort of controversial photo of her was found in the possession of sort of an Epstein-like character, mm. um, which is problematic in and of itself. Um, and the photo was taken of her as a young girl. Um, but more problematic than that is that there's an inscription on the back, um, which makes it appear that her mother gifted this photo to him. So um, the story then goes back into, um, to her mother and um, her living in Vermont at a summer stock community. Um, and her mother is an aspiring actress. And so they go to New York City, it's 1976, and so that her mother can pursue her acting dreams. And, um, and we watch as that unfolds and basically roles reverse. And um, Ryan is the one who's discovered. She's a very beautiful little girl, very mature face, um, but she's discovered on the street by a modeling agent. And so in the present day story, we watch as she makes the decision to go back to New York and sort of confront um, her mother about what complicity, if any, she has with this horrible man. Um, and then we learn the history of the photo, which is at the center of the story. And the photo was taken on the night of the 1977 blackout. So most of the past takes place between the summer of 1976 and the summer of 1977. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it was a crazy time to be in New York during yeah. that time period, I know. It's a very lost <laughs> place. <laughs> yes. Um, thankfully, in some ways, I, I am, I'm certain. <clears throat> no, a place of, like your book talks about, a lot of sketchy things happening, but also so many amazing creative things happening at right. the same time. <laughs> right. I wanted that contrast of, you know, the sort of gritty, um, dangerous place that New York mm -hmm. City was at that time, and the magical life that Ryan has. Um, she and her mother moved to a community, um, an artist community called West Beth, which is actually a mm -hmm. real place, um, and it still exists. It was the first federally funded um, artist community in the wow. country, and it's in the West Village, and um, it housed and houses hundreds of artists. And so when Ryan and her mom move, they move in with friends there. Um, it's just this sort of bustling hub of bohemian activity and the kids are feral and free and um you know and then the parents are these artists and um i really wanted to have this sort of magical place in a you know in a city that's really dying and crumbling around um to view this place and to view this city um through the eyes of a child um so that was really my intent um in terms of the setting um so yeah no, and it really, I think, comes across 
that it sort of conveys all of that craziness and how that really shaped Ryan as an adult. And so I always feel like authors are kind of haunted by things or almost compelled by things. So what was haunting you when you started writing Such a Pretty Girl? Well, I, I think this is a book that I've wanted to write for a long time. Um, and usually when I start a project, there are, it's like obsessions. You know, there are certain things mm -hmm. that I'm obsessed with that I want to explore. Um, so for this book, <clears throat> I had wanted to tell the story of what it was like to be a girl in the 1970s. I grew up in 1970s. Um, I was born in 1969. And so <clears throat> Ryan is just a little bit older than I am. And um, I'm really... Um, uh, I really wanted to sort of think about how, you know, the Me Too movement has forced a lot of us to look back at our own histories through a contemporary lens. Um, mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Ryan is doing in this story. She's looking back at the photo that was taken of her, of her career through this contemporary filter where we aren't, you know, um, the, the world is a very different place. And so, um, you know, I grew up when Brooke Shields and Jodie Foster were mm -hmm. in movies like Pretty Baby and Taxi Driver. Yeah. And, I mean, these, these women were my contemporaries and I remember the conversations and, you know, how, edgy that was. And, you know, just um, the very early sexualization of um, girls that are my age um, in my generation is something that really um, haunts me. You know, it, it's something that I think about um, and I care about and that mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, you, yes. you look back <laughs> at the ads that were around loves baby soft ad plays it's fictionalized, but it plays a large role in this story. Mm -hmm. And the, the main slogan in the 70s was, innocence, it's sexier than you think, <laughs> which is horrifying now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. time, you know, those were the magazines that I was reading when I was 10 years old, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and the messages that um, my generation of women were receiving. And so I think that was sort of the heart of my, you know, if I had any sort of message or, or topic that I wanted to explore. But in terms of the mm -hmm. characters in the setting, um, I, you know, I grew up, um, I used to dance and my dance teacher, I grew up in Vermont and my dance te mm -hmm. teacher would take us to New York City for master classes. And so mm -hmm. the New York of my childhood is this New York, you know, it's yeah. like dirty and, you know, you don't go to Times Square and, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a different place. And I really wanted to kind of capture that and um, and my memories of it, which are, you know, obviously filtered through time and memory. And, um, but I really wanted to go back to that place and, um, because there was a certain magic to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's the beauty of being a fiction writer is that you get to explore places that are gone, um, times that don't exist anymore. And, um, I wrote this during the summer of 2020 and I just wanted to be <laughs> somewhere <laughs> outside of my, outside of my home understandable. <laughs> so that was essentially it. Um, and, you know, um, the, the thing about this story is that it's not only about the relationship between Ryan and her mother, Fiona, mm -hmm. but it's also about the relationship between Ryan as an adult and her own 18 year old daughter, Sasha. And mm -hmm. I really wanted to contrast, you know, the, the two different mothers, Ryan as a mother and Fiona as a mm -hmm. mother. Um, and so that was another sort of thematic you know, interests that I had as I was writing. Yeah. What about, do you think, mother-daughter relationships do you find so compelling to explore in fiction? Um, you know, I've been writing about mothers and daughters before I was even a mother. <laughs> um, and I have a wonderful relationship with my mom. My poor mother always is, you know, <laughs> like these assumptions like, oh, was your mom like Fiona? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, my mom is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, um, I think, you know, as a mom myself, I have two daughters, um, you know, it's just something it's, it's, it's who I am. It's, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest roles that I play in my life is as a mom. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I gave a lot of, um, a lot of the, the sort of concerns and worries and mm -hmm. things that I have as a mom of a contemporary, you know, of, uh, in this yeah. now um, <laughs> with young adult children um, to, to Ryan, you know, she's raising a young woman who's independent and fierce and what awesome. And she's taking mm -hmm. a gap year and driving across the country to do a, like a photojournalism project. And, um, and she's worried. <laughs> you yeah. Know, she's <laughs> um, um, Ryan has anxiety as a child and that anxiety sort of mutates and turns into something else as an adult. Um, and so she's constantly battling that, 
to allow her child to grow up and, you know, be independent. And Mm -hmm. um, so that's a major theme in the story as well. But I do, you know, I think every mom suffers from, you know, this maternal anxiety, maternal anxiety. And um, so it was sort of easy to imbue the character with something that was familiar to me. No, that makes perfect sense because, and it is always funny as writers where people will be like, oh, did you write about this mother, this partner, because that's your real life. And it's like, well, sometimes as fiction writers, we do make things up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I only write about my life. People would get really, really bored. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. It's a lot more fun to write about things we haven't personally gone through. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yes. Do you think that in our modern culture that we kind of still have this problem of fetishizing innocence to a certain degree? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's easy to see this and and be sort of disgusted and, um, you know, looking at the ads and looking at, you know, the the complicity of some of the, the mothers and management and the industry, mm-hmm. you know, um, in the exploitation of young girls, but it's still happening. You know, um, I started thinking about you know, all of the girls of, you know, the, through, through the decades, you know, we had Drew Barrymore in the eighties mm-hmm. and um, in the nineties, we had Britney Spears and, you know, two thousands, we had Miley Cyrus being, you know, the, I don't know if you remember the Vanity Fair um, photo shoot where um, she, she was underage and she, I think her back was naked and, um, and um, you know, there's a lot of hoopla about that. And then mm-hmm. it pinned on her, like it was her choice and her error, you know, she was letting down her fans. She was still a child. So I think it is, I think it's, I think it's, things are getting better. And because of the Me Too movement, you know, we are more critical of, um, of the Mm -hmm. exploitation that um, is sort of inherent in the, in the industry. Um, But, you know, I, I I do think we still have such a long ways to go, you know, I mean, and with social media now being Mm -hmm. a platform for girls of all ages. I think it's just, it's opened up, you know, the possibility of exploitation, all sorts of other ways that weren't happening, you know, in the 1970s. So um, not to sound grim, like uh, pessimistic, but um, I do, I do think it's still a problem. I do. No, and I don't think it's pessimistic to acknowledge that because if we don't acknowledge it, how are we going to help fix it? Right, right, exactly, exactly. (laughs) And that is such an excellent point that oftentimes, and I'm sure it's still happening with some young child stars today, Mm -hmm. tragically, that, you know, they're being forced to grow up a little too fast or that, you know, there are so many like Natalie Portman and Emma Watson have spoken about how they were child stars and they had these countdown clocks to when they turned 18 and it was okay to find them attractive, which is... Right, The Olsen twins, the same thing with the Olsen twins, Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> it's par for the course, it seems. <laughs> no, which, why do you think is part of the reasons that we have this problem as a culture, which I know is a huge question <laughs> that probably no one has all the answers uh, to, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, um, women's bodies have been commodified mm-hmm. for a very, very long time. And, um, and there's a, you know, systemic, issue with with that commodification um and uh and it you know it's some it's such internalized um misogyny that you know uh, um, not just my generation but you mm-hmm. know the generations of my you know of my daughters um it's just there it's you know um media and our culture um is sort of hell-bent on you know objectifying objectifying women um, mm-hmm. and I, I, I mean, I do think some strides have been made and I love like watching, I love watching TikTok, um, yeah. because watching Gen Z kids and rejecting that is just so mm-hmm. beautiful to me. Um, you know, gender identity being, you know, something that's so fluid now and, and they're just sort of putting their feet down, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'm going to tolerate this. You're not going to, you know, I'm not going to live up to your standard, these ridiculous standards. And, um, to think that that's evidence that, you know, there is movement, um, and that, that Gen Z is, you know, just maybe going to be where the buck stops, which <laughs> would be 
great. <laughs> no, I would certainly love it if the generation that's being born now or just after Gen Z did not have to handle this nearly yeah. as much as our generations have had to handle it. So I agree with you. I've loved seeing that sort of where people are like, yeah, I'm going to look how I want to look and yeah. it's not going to have anything to do with you. Right. And that that's really being embraced, which it is. feels so different where, you know, yeah. when I grow up, I just got bullied for having curly hair because everyone else straightened their hair. Me in too, the and I still straighten my hair. <laughs> exactly. <No>. exactly. <laughs> yeah, impossible, impossible <laughs> standards too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, things that are, you know, I, I mean, I grew up in the, you know, my I was a teenager during like this, the first supermodels, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. what, you know, when you've got that to aspire to, how do you ever, you know, how do you ever mm -hmm. not be critical, self-critical? Um, but yeah, I just watched that Victoria's Secret um, documentary this summer as oh, well. Yeah. And I was like, wow, wow, this is just so pervasive <laughs> and, and present mm -hmm. and, and not that long ago that, you know, um, you know, that women were, you know, still held to this like extreme, like extreme, mm -hmm. unrealistic extreme. Yes. No. And it is, I grew up with an older sister who was involved in modeling since she was 15 years old, you know, found on the street and it starts, you know, models start so young, even nowadays, although for also some progress, New York City has made a law. There are rules that you have to be at least 18 to walk in all the big shows now. Oh, wow. So, I didn't realize that. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Yes, very and cool. they're also not allowed to discuss body measurements. And wow. Yes, so they can't be like, you know, you have to get your waist size down to this many inches, which is really excellent to have those protections in for these models. Yeah, I wonder if it works, you know, and I wonder if, it, <laughs> if there are ways around around that, you know, for the industry. Yeah, I'm sure there are like, well, you have to be able to fit into this garment. <laughs> right. um, you have to fit into this size zero, but we're not going to talk about <laughs> how yes. many inches your, your waist is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is good that at least, you know, they're trying to push and a lot of models, you know, they're pushing to change things up for themselves and for their industry and to right. get those protections, which is great. <laughs> so, right. Mm -hmm. So I know that you wrote a lot about the modeling and acting world. Have you ever been involved in those worlds yourself? No, <laughs> I haven't been. Uh, that's where I had to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I found this great book. Um, it was about the model Lisanne Falk. Um, she was a model in the 70s, right along the mm -hmm. um, same time as Brooke Shields. I think she actually did some work with Brooke Shields. And, and it was sort of like a photojournalistic book um, about like the life of Model. And I was like, oh my God, this is perfect because it was set in the time that I needed to, to just get those little weird little details. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just did a lot of research. Um, Ryan in the in the book models, but she also gets cast in a film, um, mm -hmm. which is filmed on Coney Island. Um, and, you know, again, the, the protections were not in place. Like I do have a friend whose daughter is an actress. And um, now, I mean, there's so many things mm -hmm. in play. And the mom is always on set. There's a teacher on set ensuring that, you know, um, that the homework gets done. Yeah. There's protections for people's money, you mm -hmm. know, um, so that parents aren't <laughs> with their children's, you know, um, mm -hmm. pay, pay for, for their work. And, um, so, you know, I, I, it was very interesting though, to sort of glimpse at, at a time before all of these things were in place. I mean, there, these are the, mm -hmm. you know, these are the stories of why these things are now in place are because yes. you know, some <laughs> people like Fiona were in charge of, you know, their daughter's careers. No. And it is such a, scary thing that nowadays like you're mentioning with social media we have like family vloggers who don't have those in place and who might yeah. be taking all that money they're making off their kids and filming them for who knows how many hours a day whereas if you're on set at least they're like okay this like you said there's a protection kids have to leave mm -hmm. after a certain point so it is stressful to see the new ways that yeah. parents yeah. moms are like that influencers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it is, again, it's sort of, you know, our tendency as Americans to want to um, commodify <laughs> things yeah. to make money off of, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, that's, that's problematic. It's definitely problematic. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's it's something we as a culture certainly need to work on. And maybe that will help with all of these issues is if we stop thinking like we can sell things via objectifying others, right. particularly women. Maybe right. <laughs> we'll keep these things from happening a little a little less. <laughs> but yes. So uh, I know that you're also a teacher. It seems crazy that you, I think, teach like with two jobs and yet still have all this, still wrote 14 books. That's amazing to me. But do you feel like your teaching has impact kind of your writing or have your students like inspired you to yeah. write sometimes? <laughs> yeah, I, I lead four reading critique groups and then I also teach online classes, but my reading critique mm -hmm. groups are aspiring novelists who mm -hmm. meet weekly and we discuss their work. And I think just being engaged with that process of critiquing and reading as a writer um, is, you know, and, and looking at other people's work really helps the way that I look at my own work. Um, and I think, you know, writing is such a solitary um, endeavor. It's, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. especially during COVID, <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's alone um, with your imagination and, and <laughs> your computer. Um, and so, you know, the community of writers that I have developed over the many years that I've been teaching, I don't even know how many it is, like 20 mm -hmm. years or something, um, is really important to me as a writer. Um, um, you know, I, I, I really value um, the experience of being among other writers. Um, and that's not something you always get. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, teaching is um, something that um, I really, even though it's very time consuming, I spend a lot of my time reading um, student work. Um, it's still, you know, something that I really, I have a strong passion for, I really care about. I mean, that's great that to have that kind of passion and to have that sense of community. Yeah. Do you feel that a great way to like help your writing is to find however way you can, just a community of writers to sort of share critiques, experiences with? Yeah, I think writing groups are really um, probably one of the best tools that um, aspiring writers especially can have. I know my students, some of them have been together for years and um, they really, they hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, they um, they understand what each person's um, goals are and are in full support of helping them reach those goals. Mm -hmm. um, writing groups are also great, especially adult writing groups, because you get such an eclectic mix of life experience and what everyone is bringing to the table in terms of perspective. You know, I'll have a retired professor along with a recent college graduate, along mm -hmm. with a mom who's finally, you know, the kids are out of the yeah. house and she's decided to write the book that she's wanted to write. And, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, I have such mm -hmm. a incredible mix of age, um, and experience and backgrounds and cultures and histories and um, and all of that in a way replicates readers, right? So mm -hmm. I always say, you know, you're, I if I have somebody in the group who's writing science fiction, which I don't read that much and, you know, some other people in the group might not read, it's like, no, this is the perfect audience because now you've got to convince me as somebody who prefers, you know, whatever genre yeah. um, to love these characters and to care about this world. And, and so I think it's really, really a wonderful sort of replication of the broad experience that a general readership. So when you're mm -hmm. published, you know, you've got all these people bringing all these different things to the book <laughs> at that on like this little microcosmic <laughs> level mm -hmm. um, in a writing group. I think that is so smart to point out that we really need to surround ourselves with people with different experiences who write a genre that maybe we would never really touch or even read. Right. I feel like so often, not even just as writers, but as people, we silo ourselves into our little cocoons and like yeah. we're like, well, I don't care what a sci-fi writer says about my work because I write literary fiction, so what does right. it matter? It's all storytelling. <laughs> you know, I yes. often say I don't really teach writing so much. Um, you know, on the line level. Um, when I was teaching college, I was much more focused on prose, right? But mm -hmm. the storytelling, storytelling is the same, regardless of what genre you're writing in. Um, and what I really m hope that I'm bringing to my students is an experience of telling lots and lots of stories, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and knowing 
the cadences of a, of a narrative and, um, you know, pacing and, um, and the different components that need to be there and what a character arc looks like. And it doesn't matter whether you're writing, you know, horror or literary fiction, it's good storytelling is good storytelling across the board. And I absolutely agree with that. I've often said that while I do have some genres I like more, if something is a good story, I will want to read it. The genre won't be important. <laughs> exactly. We should all strive to the same, yeah. you know, sort of level of, of um, storytelling, regardless of, you know, the genre. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's really great that you're passing that message on to your students and hopefully they're really running with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also read that you do photography. So how does that come about? And I was also wondering, was that at all influencing such a pretty girl in specific with, you know, photography in a way being such a central part of that yeah. story? Yeah, I um, I uh, have been pretty serious um, with my photography since um, since my kids were young. So probably fifteen years, twenty years or so, and. Um, um, I really love photography. Like it's a, I, I love, you know, looking at photos. I have favorite mm -hmm. photographers. Um, I just think it's such a, a profound, I mean, it's a profound different way of telling a story, right? A yes. very different way of telling a story. And mm -hmm. I'm always sneaking photographers into my novels because <laughs> I like writing about photography. But um, mm -hmm. Henri Dubois, um, who took the blackout photo, the the photo mm -hmm. that's at the heart of this this whole um, story and such a pretty girl is um, a character that I really um, gravitated toward because I feel like um, he understands Ryan and he um, he she's a muse to him in his art, um, but he also sees her and I think that's you know what all of the people in her life. Are, who are exploiting her are not seeing her. They're seeing, mm -hmm. you know, they're seeing what they want to sell. Um, and then they're doing that. Um, but Amri yes. really understands her. And um, so I, there are several chapters in the book that are italicized sort of dramatizations of photos that he took of her. Um, and I really wanted those in there to show their relationship to each other. Um, this sort of artistry um, that went into each of those photos, what they meant to her, um, and then um, ultimately what occurred when that single photo that has means different things to different people was mm -hmm. taken. So that that photograph at the that asks a question, you know, is what are you bringing to this photograph? What mm -hmm. is you know what is each of the viewers? Um, who are involved in the story bringing to that particular photograph. Which is, that is a beautiful thing about photography. And it is true with some writing, it's sort of what you see in a photograph says a lot about yourself because it's what, you know, it can't speak to you. It just isn't still image. And then you're completely interpreting. It's almost like abstract art in a way. Yeah. Well, the epigram, mm -hmm. or I think it's called epigram, epigraph, the, the beginning quote <laughs> at the mm -hmm. um, in the novel is, um, a photograph is a secret about a secret. The more it tells you, the less you know. And that's Diane mm -hmm. Arbus, Diane Arbus. Mm -hmm. Which I find is very true because I love studying photography as well. I am not a professional, <laughs> but you know, the lovely thing about camera phones is you can take fun pictures or interesting pictures of whatever you want so yeah no it's it's been amazing being able to have you know in your hand at all times the ability to mm -hmm. take a beautiful shot i actually find myself using my my good camera um mm -hmm. less frequently because i'm able to take and it's there you know it's there and mm -hmm. it's not obtrusive like the big camera it's like calls attention to you mm -hmm. you know whereas a was a phone camera you can sort of disappear into, you know, whatever landscape you're in as you're trying to, to capture something, which is kind of cool. Yeah, no, it is definitely when people see like a big professional camera, they sort of stiffen up because they're like, right. is that, are they taking a picture of me? What's right. happening? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and there's nothing, you know, I think is for myself as a photographer is I want to be invisible, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I think I, I, 
took portraits of my children mostly for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I always like, for me, for them, I was invisible. You know, I like, as Mm -hmm. the mom, I was, you know, always there. And because I had a camera with me so often, they just became kind of, I don't know, like oblivious to the camera. Um, Mm -hmm. They aren't anymore. You know, I think as they got older, that went away. But as young children, I felt like I was able to capture so much because they weren't Mm -hmm. self-conscious and they weren't conscious of me taking, you know, taking the photos. Um, But yeah, that changes, you know, Um, that's why I love photographing children so much is because there's this wonderful sort of obliviousness and selfless, (laughs) self-consciousness. Yeah. (laughs) No, I know what you mean, definitely, because they're just like, they're going to do what they're going to do, and they don't even care if you're taking a picture exactly. or not. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, And I wish I wish we could all carry that into adulthood of that sort yeah. of fun, and we're not going to worry, we're just going to be ourselves for the picture, even if it doesn't look like our most beautiful Instagrammable selves. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, How would you say your writing has sort of changed over time over the span of 14 novels, which Mm -hmm. is a very impressive span? (laughs) Um, You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I found my master's thesis um, um, from my first graduate program and I was reading, I I did poetry um, and fiction back then. And I was reading the poems. I was like, who is that? (laughs) Who is that (laughs) writer? You know, where did she go? Um, I, I feel like before I had an audience, I was really, um, I was bold. I think I took more chances, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think as, but I think maybe that I took more chances and was bolder in life too. You know, I think as you Mm -hmm. get older, more experienced and more aware of the world around you and how your actions and your art, (laughs) you know, affect the people Mm -hmm. in your life, you become less sort of, I don't know, um, bold and, and, um, and, but I also simultaneously, that's just sort of, you know, I, I feel like I'm a bit more tempered. Like I, I I think more before I Mm -hmm. produce something. Um, but I also feel like skill wise, I'm stronger, you know? So I feel like Mm -hmm. my first novel was full of heart and raw emotion and, um, and a lot of beautiful things that I was at 28 years old that I'm not anymore. Um, but it wasn't as crafted a story, you know, it wasn't, it was sort of mm-hmm. loose and, you know, jumbly. <laughs> and, and now I feel like as I get older and more experienced, um, my books are more thoughtful, um, and more, more, they're tighter narrative wise. Um, I feel like my storytelling skills have gotten stronger, so they're more satisfying maybe to mm-hmm. some readers. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a, you lose some things and you gain some things um, as you, as you write more and more. And as your audience grows, you know, it's hard mm-hmm. to sort of capture that feeling that I had as a 20 year old when I was <laughs> writing in college, you know, being like, nobody's ever going to read this. I can say whatever <laughs> I want. Whereas now I'm like, what is somebody on Goodreads going to think if I, <laughs> you know, oh, no. what are they going to, you know, is this a two star? Is this a two star <laughs> moment? Or, um, so yeah, mm. it's, it's a, it's a mixed bag that you, that you get when you, when you have an audience. Mm-hmm. That is fascinating to think about that with publishing, you kind of, gain the knowledge that like, oh yeah, this is for sure. I'm, this is, will be read by people, which is of yeah. course what you want, but also then it's like, and they're going to think about it, whatever they're going to think. And they're exactly. also probably going to let everyone know <laughs> right. online also. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's very interesting. I, and it, and you know, with each book, I think the audience grows a little bit more, you know, a little bigger. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I definitely, there's always sort of this inner critic you know, who's like, oh, that's a terrible idea, (laughs) you know, or you can't say that, you know, and, Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. Um, I, I always try to approach first drafts as if I'm 20 and nobody's going to (laughs) read, nobody's going to read what I, what I've written, but it's hard. It's hard to capture that, you know, and especially in the editing process, that's when I start really overthinking things. And, um, but yeah. No, it is much harder, I think, to sort of bring your writing as it is and not worry so much what 
how everyone will interpret every statement. <laughs> but right. it is great that, you know, you get those technical stills that really carry your stories and convey them maybe much clearer than you were able to sort yeah. of in your 20s. <laughs> exactly. There's got to be a nice mix, you know, where you still mm -hmm. have that sort of liberation and freedom and, and courage, um, but also, you know, the, the, the necessary skills to, to be thoughtful and, um, and precise. Mm -hmm. Which is, I would say, I haven't fully read this book. I'm have it ordered. So hopefully it will be here <laughs> soon because I was fascinated by it when I just read about it. But the snippets that I've been able to read have been very thoughtful and very thought provoking for me, you know, thinking about our current media culture. So Great. I think it's fantastic. And I definitely think everyone should give it a read and also then take with it maybe some lessons, some inspiration for looking at modern things today with maybe a slightly more critical. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, it's, I mean, it's so weird to hear something about like the time that I was a kid being called <laughs> historical fiction. <laughs> Nothing makes you feel older than that. But, um, you know, I be, despite it being set, you know, 50 years ago, um, I really still feel like it's very topical and very timely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my hope is that it really translates well to, you know, to really examining, you know, examining where we are now, um, as well as the experiences that the readers um, have had in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Which I think is what great mm -hmm. literature should do for us. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. So we are nearing the end of our time, but what are you doing next and where can people follow you? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm on most platforms. So on yes. Facebook, um, I'm T Greenwood author. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my Facebook page. Um, I'm on Twitter and on Instagram, um, both as at T G Wood 505. There it is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same on Twitter. Um, and I just started TikTok, <laughs> <laughs> which is also TG with 505. Um, Perfect. <laughs> that is a new place for me. Um, mm -hmm. but I love watching it. I just, you know, being on there is a whole other thing. But I've been doing some fun, like mm -hmm. fun things to have to do with the book, you know, image images and music and, and things from, from that time period, which has been really fun. Um, and in terms of what I'm working on next, I have a book coming out next year, almost exactly a year from now. I think October 24th is the, um, the pub date and it's called, um, the still point and it's, um, set in the world of pre-professional ballet. And it's primarily about the mothers of some aspiring ballet dancers. Um, and, um, there's one dancer's point of view, um, it's a multi-point of view story. And uh, so, yeah, it's another book um, about art and ambition and mothers and daughters, um, mm -hmm. uh, familiar territory, but um, but in a world that I think a lot of people don't really know about. Um, mm -hmm. So that'll be kind of fun. No, we will definitely look forward to hopefully bringing you back for an interview about that next October so we can discuss that. But definitely an endless subject, I think, that yeah. you can talk about. Totally. Yes. And for my final question, it is, is there anything I didn't ask you about or bring up that you want to talk about? Oh my goodness. <laughs> question. Um, hmm. I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I think you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> like you had all, the, all the highlights. A little early for me. I'm on the West Coast. So <laughs> oh, yes. Can you give me another cup of coffee in another hour I probably come up with something <laughs> perfect well if you think of anything we would love to talk to you some more but for now we will head out so thank you so much thank for you. everybody who is watching for joining us and thank you so much Tammy for joining us on Litfic and remember to call up Warwick's to order a signed copy of Such a Pretty Girl. That, lit, that information is in the comments for that website. And remember to please like, follow, and subscribe to us for more blazing goodness and more amazing authors like Tammy Greenwood. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is really fun. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>